I've just been on a journey I've always wanted to go on. Exploring an ancient wisdom. Meditation. It took me from the foothills of the Himalayas to a city where they're trying to levitate. It was inspiring, frustrating, and at times, emotional. So then I felt sad, as you can see. In the West, over 10 million of us practice meditation every day. It's said it can solve so many of our problems and can help to heal not just our spirit, but our mind and body too. May help cardiac arrhythmias, allergies, anxiety, depression, bronchial asthma, diabetes, constipation, infertility. I found out how scientists are investigating meditation and heard some extraordinary ideas. By meditating, you can become happier, you can concentrate more effectively, and you can change your brain in ways that support that. So what is meditation, and can it really help us? There's so many different ways that meditation can influence the body and the brain, and we're really just beginning to scratch the surface. I've always been interested in meditation and in the last few years I've learned that if I sit still for half an hour a day and calm my mind, then that really helps me. But is that meditation? I was on my way to Kathmandu in Nepal to find out. I was going there for a simple reason. Kathmandu is a place where Westerners go to learn Buddhist meditation, and I wanted to try it too. I think normally your instincts as a scientist when you're approaching a topic are to um, find out about science. You know, you can go to the internet, find a load of papers and, and read up about a subject that you're going to be approaching. Now, I think it's quite important with things that sometimes feel like they're not always um, sitting comfortably with science, to try to experience it and feel it from the other perspective. Hi. Now I want to go to Sichuan Tengi Dargeening Monastery, or something like that. Do you know it? Okay, good. I'm going to meet this guy, Matthew Ricard. He's a Buddhist monk, and he's been meditating for 30 years, and he's offered to be my teacher. And he seems to be the link, or at least one of the really important links, between meditation and science. I don't think he does know where he's going. Chechen, Tengi, Dargeening, yes. Monastery. Yes, yes. It's this way. Yes. Yeah? yeah. Well, the taxi driver's just got up the cab to have a chat with somebody now. I knew we were very lost when the taxi driver put somebody into the boot of the car to give us directions. It's a bit stressful not speaking the language. I'm not feeling terribly relaxed, but I guess that will come. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. Eventually I arrived at what I hoped was the right monastery. <laughs> Can you tell me where Matthew Ricard is? <laughs> Inside? Thank you. This is the man. Oh gosh, I'm a bit scared. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. you. I'm very well. How so are you? It's a long way. 
<laughs> we got very lost. Uh, it should have just been five minutes, I think. Hey, but thank you for, for offering to help me. Well, I don't know. We'll try. <laughs> we'll try. So shall we? Mathieu is one of the Dalai Lama's personal French interpreters and has been described as the happiest man in the world, a title he finds embarrassing. He's also a trained molecular biologist. And he hadn't just offered to be my personal teacher. He's also very open to the scientific exploration of meditation. I think we should demystify meditation through science. It's not just a weird Eastern philosophy. It's really dealing with something very deep that concerns me, that concerns my family, that concerns society. I'm deeply involved in uh, science research in neuroscience, mm -hmm. which are precisely studying the effect of meditation, short and long term, on mm. the brain. That's very exciting. And so we are no more like guinea pigs, although you know, I'm, I'm a guinea pig, but also yeah. collaborators. We sort of co-design the protocols. Mathieu spends several months a year in retreat doing intensive meditation. So I was in great hands to learn the very basics. So first to be in a comfortable position. You know, if you have pain everywhere and you are sort of, or if you are sitting like that, you, know, you fall asleep, <laughs> and, or if you are too tense you will feel pain. So sitting in a nice position. And then the spine should be quite straight, and the gaze should be like in the prolongation of the nose. We say 12 fingers. Then we need to begin to pay attention to something. And we can take an old object, but a thing that is very basic in the Buddhist meditation is to begin by paying attention to the going in and out of our breathing. Out and in. Usually what happens? You are just sitting here quietly, supposed to calm your mind, and then, like out of nowhere, a thought comes about something that may be not even related mm. to what we are doing now. Poof! Something from the past, something from the, about the future, almost like, like a bubble <laughs> popping up in the lake. Mm. You don't know why. Let the thoughts come, let the thoughts go. Not blocking them, you are not encouraging them. Just aware That's of one them. of the secrets. Okay, so I feel like I've, I've got, I can, I'm in a good position to go practice. I breathe, I relax, I keep my sense of balance, I focus about here, and I allow thoughts to come and let them go. Yeah. Okay, thank right. you. So I'll let you try. Thank you very much. Okay, see you soon. See you soon. I'll come find you when I need, All right. when I need more help. Sorry, call me unprofessional. <laughs> it's quite hard when you're being scrutinised. Over the next few days, I practised hard spending a few hours focusing on what Mathieu had taught me, concentrating on my breathing. As I became better at it, I tried something else he'd suggested. Concentrating on how you feel about someone you love unconditionally. So I thought about my dad. Mm. Well, I began by oh, being really focused, oh, just hearing really clearly the birds and the wind and the planes. And there was a monk walking around in the room out there, gently chanting. 
So just being really aware of those sounds. The recent thing I've been feeling about has been about my dad. And you know, dad dying. So then I felt sad. So I thought about, oh, being with sad. If I sit with being sad about dad, or just give my spell, myself space to think about him. It's only two months ago he died, something like that. Then I know that I do sad and I cry, and I think that's really good. And my eyes were quite tired by then, so I closed them. And the monk was still wandering about. And it just felt very calm. I found meditating quite a powerful experience and one that was comforting in my grief. When I spoke to Mathieu later, he wasn't surprised as he believes meditation could help everyone in their lives. Well, I think the benefit of meditation is, of course, fundamentally to make you a better human being. <laughs> That's not bad. Isn't it? Isn't and it the main thing? Decrease of anxiety, emotional balance, happiness, compassion. <laughs> Meditation is not just a hobby. It's something that's going to change the very way you experience every moment of your life. Nepal had been a great place to start my journey. Meditating had made me feel calmer. But how much was that to do with being in a magical place, away from deadlines, or just having the time to think about my dad? It was now time to find out about the science. Matthew's really whetted my appetite. I think there should be some really interesting stuff going on. So maybe I need to stop the meditation for a bit and start to find out about the evidence. Bristol, I realized that if you want to find out about the science of meditation, you quickly run into problems. For a start, where in the bookshop do you actually look? I don't even know where to begin. Is it religion? Spirituality? Health? I was surprised at how many different types of meditation there are and the different ways you can practice. You can focus on your breathing, like I tried in Nepal. Or a mantra, that's repeating a word or phrase. Or it can be practiced as part of yoga. Also what's clear is it's not just about improving your spiritual well-being. Some people claim it helps with a whole load of health problems. The health claims are really quite <laughs> surprising. Massive list. May help cardiac arrhythmias, allergies, anxiety, depression, bronchial asthma, Cold sores, coughs, let's see, ulcers, diabetes, constipation, infertility. Also, lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, um, support in having to kick addictions. It's supposed to help to speed the healing of psoriasis and it relieves pain. It's an amazingly long list of different things that are being claimed and they're massive claims. What interests me is how meditation, which is all about what goes on in your mind, can actually help with physical illnesses. Now, I found this book written by a guy, Dr. Herbert Benson, who was looking at people who meditated about 30 years ago and actually measuring their physiological changes, so their blood pressure, their heart rate, their breathing rate, that kind of thing. Now, in Nepal, when I meditated, it felt different you know I felt like I was in a slightly different headspace but you know I was quite jet-lagged and I was in a different country and it was quite idyllic being in a monastery so I'd love to have another go but actually have those things being measured on me
Dr. Herbert Benson works at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He studied a myriad of different types of meditation and their effects on the body. He believes they produce a deep physical relaxation, which he's called the relaxation response. Hi, Dr. Benson. Kathy Sykes is in the waiting room for you. Oh, hi. Very nice to meet you. Dr. Benson's team offered to demonstrate what he meant by the relaxation response on me. Comfy? Yeah, more or less. Great. We're <laughs> experts at this, so you're in good hands. I was hooked up to several machines which would measure my stress levels. Almost every part of me was monitored. My pulse, the tension in my muscles, my breathing rate, even the sweat on my skin. So. These tools are fantastic. They're like a way of seeing inside people's bodies and brains without me being able to stop you. I'm feeling a little bit like I'm um, some kind of lab rat that's been experimented on. I was told to sit quietly for 10 minutes so they could get measurements of my resting baseline. Then I was told I was going to be stressed out. Okay, Kathy. Now what we're going to have you do is subtract a four-digit number and you're going to subtract 14 in sequence. So 14 each time. 14 each time. And if you can actually look at the monitor, you can see that Justine's instructions I've got stress have given you a stress response all over. Your respiration rate has become more jagged. Your skin conductance level has gone up, that orange line. So now it's fun. Let's begin. 1,500. Begin. <laughs> oh, no! A little bit faster. <laughs> 14, 17. Start again. 1,500. <laughs> 1486. Fifty two. That's incorrect. Start again. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. Start again. Fourteen eighty six. Fourteen eighty six. You've got um. that one down. Ah. Incorrect. Fifteen hundred. Oh, you 1500. bastard. Fifteen hundred. <laughs> You're so mean. <laughs> well, what's the number again? Fifteen hundred. So bad at subtraction. This is unbearable. Come on, you can do it. My pulse was racing and I was starting to sweat. All over a few simple sums. 14, um, 26. Incorrect. Start again. Start again? Start again. From 1500. The beginning. Come on, Can come I stop on. now? You cannot stop. We have a normalized scale and you're really, really low. Two, um, After 10 minutes of total humiliation, Dr. Benson stepped in. How did you feel during that? <laughs> <clears throat> I felt very stressed because I, I ought to be okay at subtraction and trying to do it on the spot. It's more difficult. W while being <clears throat> filmed, while there's an audience. Due to this pressured subtraction, your skin conductance went up. Mm -hmm. Your muscle tension went up. Your heart rate went up. All of these were being measured by real time as you were being stressed. Now you're in a more calm, normal baseline mode. And now we want to take you through the relaxation response. Great, that will be more fun, won't it? He then made me do a simple meditation exercise and asked me to think of a word to focus on. A sound. Calm. Close your eyes and relax all your muscles. Now each time your breath is coming out, say silently to yourself the word calm. And let the M go calm. And you're going to find all... As I meditated, my pulse and breathing rate actually went below the normal level at rest. This is what Dr. Benson means by the relaxation response. He believes it can be triggered not just through meditation, but by other relaxation techniques, like breathing exercises or Tai Chi. Skin conductance decreased, heart rate slow down. Your rate of breathing markedly lowered. It's a whole package and that package is the relaxation response. So meditating had caused real physical responses in my body. But Dr. Benson has taken this finding further. He claims that the relaxation response can help with a whole range of medical conditions where he believes stress plays a part like asthma, infertility, and diabetes. To the extent that any disorder is caused or made worse by stress, to that extent regular elicitation of the relaxation response will counteract that condition. 
These were big claims, and the link between stress and illness isn't fully understood. But scientifically, it's not unreasonable to think that relaxation might help with certain conditions. I went to meet one of Dr. Benson's patients. Tony Compagnoni, a pediatrician, has systemic mastocytosis, a rare and chronic illness that has horrible physical symptoms. I felt completely as though I were dying. That's how it was. And the symptoms came upon me so rapidly and, and without really any kind of warning that I, I felt honestly as though my life were going to end in about six months. And I was physically and mentally prepared to be dead. Tony was given a cocktail of drugs, but still had a lot of symptoms and anxiety about his illness. So he decided to go on one of Dr. Benson's courses. It um, involved, first of all, learning the relaxation response as a, um, as a way of sort of getting hold of your, your sort of your immediate emotional state. Beyond that, though, it was a lot of information about diet and exercise. It's quite a combination of different things, isn't it? It's not just the relaxation response. It's diet, exercise. How crucial would you say the meditation was in the whole of that myriad of different things, as well as, well as the group kind of counseling, the group therapy? Yeah, it's, because you're all it, doing it together. It's the cornerstone. I have to say, honestly, it's the cornerstone. It, without it, you can't achieve the other things. I almost never see the skin rashes anymore. They've almost completely stopped. Yeah, I mean, I used to have these brown spots that, uh, that have almost resolved. Markedly fewer episodes of rapid heart rate or tachycardia. Uh, improvement in my reflux. So less indigestion. Less indigestion. Now you're a really busy doctor. Yeah. How do you manage to keep on meditating each day. You know, biggest, it's a hard thing yeah. to fit into a busy lifetime, right? Biggest challenge of the day. Biggest challenge of the day is to try to figure out when you're going to actually get to it. So it sounds like meditation has really helped you to get your life back. Absolutely. Unquestionably, I'm not sure where I would be now if I hadn't started the meditation. remarkable. But scientifically, you can't make any general conclusions from just one person's experience. And it's also hard to know exactly what's making the difference for Tony. Is he just going through a good patch? Or is his drug treatment starting to work? Or is it Dr. Benson's course? And if so, what part is meditation playing? Dr. Benson treats his patients with everything he can, you know, diet, exercise, as well as the relaxation response. But it means it's going to make it really hard for me to unpick it all and find out the real effect of just the meditation. One of the ways doctors try to find out whether meditation techniques have any health benefits is to carry out trials and you can look up the papers on the internet. There are a number about Dr. Benson and his relaxation response. But what happens when you look at just meditation? I'm just going to check on an online database that's got just about every scientific, every peer-reviewed scientific paper on to see what it has to say about Tony's illness and meditation. I get nothing. Okay, so there's nothing in here about Tony's illness. But it's not so surprising, it's quite a rare condition. So, what about other health conditions? Let's try asthma. And meditation. Okay, 13 papers for asthma and meditation. Let's see, what else? What about chronic pain and meditation? 
33 papers. That's quite a few. Now, at first I thought, great, there's loads of publications, more than I'd imagined. But when I look at it more closely, I can see they've looked at loads of different kinds of meditation. People have done it in different ways. They've mixed it with other kinds of therapies. And they've been looking at loads of different illnesses. There are so many different factors involved, so many different things that are varying. It's going to be hard to draw any kind of conclusions. Now, that's the thing with science. You just want one or two variables, and then it's really straightforward. You can't do that with meditation. But one thing did catch my eye. There are lots of papers looking at the effects of meditation on heart disease, carried out by one particular group. Heading to the Maharishi Vedic city in Iowa, home to a community devoted to one particular type of meditation, Transcendental Meditation, or TM. They claim that practicing TM daily can have an impact on almost everything, from blood pressure to world peace. I'm just about to arrive at the Maharishi Vedic city. It just seems totally weird that something like this would be in the middle of America. And I mean the middle of America. Is this it? I think this is. Something that makes me feel skeptical about seeing this group is the way they often explain how TM works. They commonly say its effects are down to quantum physics and something called the unified field theory. But the unified field theory hasn't even been established yet. So as a physicist, I find it troubling. But I decided to put my skepticism to one side because the health research they've carried out, at first glance, does look rather interesting. Hi. Are you Kathy? I am Kathy, yes. Have I actually arrived in yes. the Vedic city? Yes, we are in Vedic City. Uh -huh. um, so, this is the registration card. Okay. I'll just need to have you sign below. I'd arranged to meet their press officer, Stephen Yellen, who'd offered to show me around the city. So, Kathy, I'm going to give you a little tour of Marsha Vedic City. You ready? I'm ready. So, we're coming up to a, um, a bunch of houses which were built according to this ancient system of architecture. Or Vedic architecture. According to this system of architecture, if you build a home according to certain principles of natural law, you'll have better health, more prosperity, better family relations. You see here the homes here, uh, better success. How many people live here? There's about 500 people that live in Marsh Vedic City. And they come from all over the United States because it's such a unique community, they can't find it anywhere but here. Stephen put me in touch with a family who'd moved here 28 years ago. Hi, Hi I'm Kathy. Nice to nice see you. Nice to meet you. Come on in. Wow, so is this a, a fairly typical Vedic uh, I think they're all very different. Uh, they're, they're very different. There are certain guidelines that they build it by, you know, certain proportions, and uh, um, I couldn't tell you the mathematical proportions, but, <laughs> but they really work. They're wonderful to live in. Do you meditate? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, 35 years for me? How long has it been for you? 35. 35. 35. Yeah. And, and what difference do you think it makes to you? I, I can't imagine not doing it, to be honest with you. Uh, it's just, we have six children, so raising a huge family. Uh, every morning I start the day with meditation and I'm rested, I'm happy, I'm pretty balanced most of the time. <laughs> and then when you start to get fatigued at the end of the day, you meditate again. And so the evening is good quality, you know. 
So hi guys, I'm Kathy. Yes. Hi. Issa. Nice to meet you, Issa. Tim. Hi, hi. Sam. So you both meditate as well? Yes. Yeah. What does it do for you? Um, I think it's like a better working environment in school when everybody meditates. They're just more well-rounded and ready for school and academics. When we get up in the morning and we go to school and meditate every day, twice a day, before academics and then after. So it just gets us ready for the day. So your whole school meditates yeah, yeah. Yes. together? Yeah. How does that feel? We're just regular kids learning the exact same things, just we practice meditation. It gets pretty, you know, annoying sometimes and mom's like, have you meditated today? It's just, <laughs> but I mean, in the end it just really helps. I mean, it's just like, it, it makes me just, you know, so relaxed and like happy. It's clear that the people who live here are very committed to this way of life. But so far, everything I'd seen was about lifestyle, rather than science. And what was slightly unsettling for me is that you can only find out how to practice TM if you go on a course, and that can cost $2,500. Although sometimes they help if you can't afford to pay. Everybody looks kind of shiny-eyed and terribly nice. And everybody, everywhere, is talking about TM. Everybody says it's changed their life. And people do look remarkably content. Exactly what it is, I have no idea. And, you know, all the other forms of meditation. You can go to a book, go to a website, buy a CD, speak to a monk if you're lucky. The secrecy of it is is a bit funny. Though I still didn't really understand how you actually practice TM, Stephen had arranged for me to see an advanced form. It's called yogic flying. Apparently, if you get good enough at it, you actually float above the ground. Though, no one's done that recently. You're going to see hopping. You're not going to see levitation. The experience inside the person is that there's this tremendous feeling of happiness and bliss and energy that's being generated from within. And a spontaneous result of that is that the body starts moving forward. Would you like to have a go at it? I think I'd have to have a go at it. It's a blast. It's bubbling bliss. Bubbling bliss. They look like they're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite feel like bliss. <laughs> I'd seen some pretty strange things and felt it would be easy to dismiss this group. But putting all that to one side, this group are carrying out health research that's been published in well-regarded scientific journals. And the US government has given them over $20 million to help to fund this research. One of their leading scientists, Dr. Robert Schneider, was currently in Holland. But they arranged for me to speak to him via satellite in their TV studios. You'll be conversing with uh, Dr. Schneider by phone. You'll ask your question, and then you'll mute your phone, which uh, is where? Here. And then the response, you'll see the video come up on the screen and the audio from the speaker behind that light. Oh, there he is. He's meditating. He is. How come he's not picking up the phone? Uh, he's coming out of meditation. He's coming I'm out? Sure. You, sh 
Yeah. He started moving around. You can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the number. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, he'll be so we'll just stick with it. Yeah. If you come out of meditation too quickly, mm -hmm. because you're so deep, it's like being woken up out of a deep sleep. You sort of, so you take two or three minutes to sort of, you know, just stop the practice of TM, mm -hmm. let the body come out a little bit, then you open your eyes, and then you're ready to go. I started by asking him what he believed the general health benefits of practicing TM are. The research on transcendental meditation done by our group, as well as about 600 other studies done by 200 research institutions and universities in 30 countries around the world, have consistently shown that the Transcendental Meditation Program evokes a unique state of deep rest and orderliness of the brain and nervous system. And this results in improved mental health, physical health, and even improved social health and positive effects on the environment as well. But what I was really interested in were the studies on TM and heart conditions. And what kind of benefits have you seen um, for cardiovascular conditions? Our first research showed that practice of the Transcendental Meditation Program lowers blood pressure in people with high blood pressure or people tending to high blood pressure without harmful side effects. And the most recent series of studies have shown reduced death rates from heart attacks and strokes amongst individuals practicing the Transcendental Meditation Program compared to controls. And these studies have been published in the top medical journals, such as the Archives of Internal Medicine, published by the American Medical Association. Again, these were impressive claims, and they seem to have done a lot of research. But what have other scientists made of it? It was time to go back home and dig a little deeper. a large number of trials. One way to make sense of it all is to look at what are called reviews. This is when all the available evidence is pulled together and compared to see if any conclusions can be reached. Although it's not a perfect system and can miss out promising individual studies, many doctors turn to reviews when they're trying to work out whether or not to recommend a treatment to a patient. Okay, I found these two reviews, one from 2004, the other from 2007. They've looked specifically at transcendental meditation and the effect on heart health. This one here says, the one from 2004, there's insufficient good quality evidence to conclude whether or not TM has a cumulative, so like a long-term, positive effect on blood pressure. So it's pretty disappointing, really. I mean, work that, to me, looked reasonable, published in decent journals, looking fairly convincing, and, and actually the jury's out. But that's quite an old study. One of the things the more recent 2007 review looked at was whether TM worked better for your heart than another relaxation technique, or even just educating people about how to live a healthy lifestyle. Again, the findings are limited. There's not very much, I can say, with any kind of certainty. I think perhaps the most concrete thing is that if you have high blood pressure, if you use TM instead of another kind of relaxation technique involving your muscles being relaxed, you might be slightly better off with a TM. So looking at this as a scientist, there's just not very much to hold on to. And it gets even more confusing. Some scientists, including those studying TM, dispute the findings and also claim they aren't even up to date. But science is like this. There's usually a debate and it's hard to get clear answers. I 
I guess the one thing I can hold on to is this. If your doctor doesn't object and you feel like trying some form of meditation, then why not? It's something that might suit your lifestyle, a bit like jogging does for me. But all my research on the internet had thrown up something interesting. It's not to do with physical health, but mental health. As a teenager, Carol Catley suffered from depression. Ten years ago, her husband died suddenly, and her depression returned. I instantly wanted to, felt as if I wanted to die, you know, I couldn't think of what else to do, you know. It's a gut reaction that life is impossible. You hate life. To control her depression, Carol took medication, but after a few years, she wanted to stop taking it. Her psychiatrist suggested that she might benefit from a new therapy designed to prevent people from falling back into depression. To her surprise, the majority of the course was meditation. I wasn't sort of frightened of meditation. I, I, it sort of didn't seem very weird to me, but I was just intrigued that the scientists were now using a contemplative method to sort people's mental health problems out. Perhaps especially noticing the movement that the breath makes as it comes into the abdomen. The meditation techniques they use are based on Buddhist practices, similar to what I'd been taught in Nepal, with a focus on breathing. It has stopped me from just living in my head with my thoughts, and it's given me a much um, better picture of what, what it's like to be alive, really. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We're going to start off with an eating meditation. One of the pioneers involved in developing the treatment is Professor Mark Williams, a leader in the field of clinical depression. Just noticing where the mind has gone and bringing it back. He'd offered to show me what goes on in one of his sessions. The treatment is called MBCT, which stands for Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. It combines meditation with a widely used psychological treatment called cognitive therapy. The main thing that people learn during the eight weeks, the eight classes they come to, um, is intensive uh, meditation. About 80% is mindfulness meditation, about 20% cognitive therapy. The mindfulness approach teaches a way of looking at the problems, observing them clearly, but not necessarily trying to fix them or solve them. It suggests to people that they begin to see all their thoughts as just thoughts, whether they're positive, negative or neutral. I'm going to come around and uh, give each of you a single raisin. And so far, there have been four trials and the results suggest that MBCT reduces the chance of a recurrence of depression by 50% in people who've been depressed three times or more. But even with these promising results, Professor Williams is cautious. Gradually it is spreading through the country and there are more and more places where you can have mindfulness if you've been depressed many times. So it's become enormously popular. Um, quite quickly. And quite quickly. And in many ways, we now need to collect the evidence to check that it really is being effective. Coming back to seeing if your mind wanders. Though it's early days, the treatment has shown such promise, it's becoming increasingly available on the NHS. I've been on medication for about 10 years, and um, this is the first time I've been able to drop as low as I have. And I'm on lower than what's the normal lowest dose right now. Yeah. And to come down as far as I have is just amazing to me, and, and to still be kind of enjoying life or whatever, you know, yes. to being able to be okay with it. From what I'd seen, it looks like meditation could do a tremendous amount of good. But then Professor Williams said something, almost casually, 
that took my journey off in a whole new direction. What we're finding is that mindfulness-based work is not just useful for people who've been depressed, but for anybody. Anybody? How can it help anybody, then? Because it involves uh, dealing with expectations, with constantly judging ourselves, analysing ourselves, feeling they're not good enough or that they're a bit of a mm. fraud. And that's something which is so widespread in our communities. All of these things are just thoughts and they will come up in meditation and learning to recognise what they are as thoughts and let them go can be enormously empowering for anybody. Of all the claims I've heard when making this series, this has to be the most inspiring for me. The idea that meditation can help all of us, even if we're not ill. I mean, we all feel inadequate some of the time. You know, overwhelmed, too self-critical. They're things we all suffer from. The thought that meditation might help us to have better control of our emotions has to be worth exploring. Can you go to Temple Meet? Yeah, no problem. Just look at my life. Like most people, I'm constantly trying to juggle all sorts of things. I'm going to Hull on Thursday, filming with Nigel. And we're going straight from Hull to London. We're filming on Friday as well. I don't think I've got any space for about three weeks, unless we do it at a weekend. I think it's really easy for lots of us to have those niggling thoughts that go around in your head. You do that. <gasps> I must remember to do the this, and I, oh, I was really rude to him, wasn't I? I have really struggled in the past to switch off. I forced myself to lie on that sofa and do nothing, and just sit still for half an hour listening to music. And unless I do that, I, I just can't switch off. Everyone can train your mind a few minutes a day, just as we do fitness exercise, and we train in learning all kinds of information. It's possible. Professor Williams' belief that meditation can help us all to be more content had been suggested to me before. It took me back to what Mattia had said to me in Nepal. What would you say the real benefits of meditation are? Becoming a better human being. <laughs> That's not bad. Isn't it? Isn't and it the main thing? Decrease of anxiety, emotional balance, happiness, compassion. <laughs> All this talk about compassion, happiness, emotional stability might sound rather new agey and a bit woolly. But then I began to look into it more and what I found was fascinating. There's a small band of scientists who are starting to look at this area of meditation and emotional well-being. And they're using technology that allows them to look inside our brains. Now, for this part of my journey, I really can't expect there to be any answers. The thing is, the work is still so much in its infancy. But I hope at least to get a glimpse of how scientists are trying to unravel the potential effects of meditation. Madison, Wisconsin, in the heart of America's Middle West. It's home to the Wasteman Laboratory for brain imaging and behavior, where they study emotions. Dr. Richard Davidson, a neuroscientist, has been inspired by Buddhist monks, including my teacher, Machia, and he's pursuing some extraordinary ideas. By meditating, you can become happier, you can concentrate more effectively, and you can change your brain in ways that support that. There was one particular study I wanted to talk to him about. It involved ordinary people, like you and me. In fact, very like me a small group of scientists who worked in a busy biotechnology company. 
we went into this company and we asked people who were interested to volunteer to participate in a study of the effects of meditation in reducing stress. They went on a course similar to what I'd seen in Oxford with MBCT. Mainly meditation, but also some stress reduction techniques. They filled out questionnaires before and after the course, which asked them about their stress levels and happiness. How about their reported feelings? Did they say they felt happier too? Interestingly, they do. They, they reported less anxiety and more happiness. But Dr. Davidson didn't stop there. He wanted to find out what was actually happening to their brains. So he measured their brain activity before and after the course. We found that there were significant changes that occurred over time in the brains of the people who went to the meditation group compared to the control group. What he found was a shift in brain activity from the right-hand side of their brains to the left. Based on previous work he's done, he's come up with a theory to explain what this might mean. People with more left-sided activation report that they are more enthusiastic, that they are more active, uh, that they are happier. He believes that by learning to meditate, you can improve your emotional well-being and actually alter your brain. It means that certain psychological qualities which have been regarded as fixed characteristics of people, like the capacity to pay attention or uh, the uh, extent to which one is happy, uh, that those really should be better regarded as skills which can be trained rather than as fixed traits. It's a lovely idea that we might be able to change parts of our personality through meditation. So we're not necessarily stuck with, oh, feeling unhappy or being uptight. But for now, it's just an idea. It needs a lot more scientific investigation. But Dr. Davison has given us a clue about what to look for. If he's right about the way that meditation may affect us all, then there might be physical changes happening in the brain, and they'd be something that scientists can measure. Once, everyone thought that the adult brain was fixed and never changed. But in a series of groundbreaking studies, this was overturned. One of them was on juggling. Now, entertainers like these are just one of the groups that have been studied in this new area of science. The study showed that if you took a group of people and over three months taught them how to juggle, the visual areas of their brain, so back here, the ones that were involved in following where the balls go, actually changed in just three months. The study showed that when we learn new skills, what we're doing is changing the physical structure of our brains. And the more we practice, the more the brain changes, which is why we keep on getting better at the skill. This process is called neuroplasticity. And you can keep on changing a brain throughout your entire adult life. So I'm going to give you one ball. One start. ball, thank you. Down up. I can't even up. catch very well then. Uh, your elbows People by your side. One point here and another point here. You want to focus on. And, <laughs> and then, I'm going to give you another one now. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four. One, two. No, now, you, now you've passed that one over. Even the film crew's laughing at me. So the director's laughing at me. Everyone laughs at a beginner. Up, I don't feel up, very good down, at this. Down. It really is difficult. Try starting with that hand now. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. You know, I'm not sure I've changed any of my brain yet, but these guys all have. The idea that physical changes happen in your brain 
when you're learning a new skill is something that is fairly well established now. But what few people have looked at is whether physical changes happen in your brain by thought alone, by something like meditation. But that work's just starting. I was on the final leg of my journey and about to meet up with someone who was trying to find out if meditation might actually change the physical structure of our brains. At the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Dr. Sarah Lazar is conducting one of the first experiments in this area. She studied a group of ordinary healthy people who practiced a form of meditation which focuses on the breath. These are not monks, so they're not people taking vows. And I think that's a really important part of the study is that these are people who, they're everyday people. Yeah, there was a chef, a computer programmer, a doctor, a lawyer. Um, and they're just people who sit and meditate for 35, 45 minutes a day. 